So now we come to our closing panel discussion. And for this, I pass back to Adam Smith in London to introduce the theme and the panelists. Thank you very much indeed, Ole. Um, as we heard at the beginning from Tawana Coupe, the University of Pretoria plans to open a centre for the study of the future of work. And there are many such centres around the world. And so the question is, what should this centre in particular focus on? And we thought it would be interesting to devote our last panel to considering that question. So in a minute, we're going to meet our panellists. But first, we thought it would be nice to ask some of the young people around campus what they thought would be the best, the most important thing to focus on if one was considering the future of work. And here is what they said. I think the most important thing to consider when looking at the future of work is how the education system is structured. The education system is not structured in such a way where technology is made emphasis of as it should be as the future looks more technologically inclined and education systems are still very much paper based. We should remember to remain teachable and remain flexible because if we stop involving then we will not be able to keep up with the ever changing environment of the corporate workforce. Oxford educated historian Yuval Noah Harari said that he encourages all of us to question today's narratives and to connect present concerns with past developments. I believe that people should question their leaders and question the world around them. In the future of work, people should look to human connections and leadership, but also look to competence and to ability. The most important thing for me to consider about the future of work is that there must be equal opportunities for people and we must create a diverse workforce to enhance our creative thinking skills. Thank you very much indeed for those thoughtful and insightful comments. So now I hope I'll be able to connect with our panelists for our closing panel. Um, it would, I hope I'll see them on screen around me now. We are going to have with us um, two, two Nobel laureates we've met before, Brian Schmidt and Chris Pissarides, also Zainab Usman, who you've already met, and we're joined, I'm pleased to say, by a panellist from South Africa, new to this meeting, Andy Uren, who is Head of Organisational Effectiveness at Nedbank in South Africa. Welcome to you all. So you've heard me introduce the question that we're going to be talking about, which is what should the new Centre for the Study of the Future of Work at the University of Pretoria focus on? Um, I also recorded a couple of comments from laureates who couldn't join us live today, Joe Stiglitz and Mohammed Yunus, and I thought we might begin, while you're thinking of your answers, with the comment from Joe Stiglitz. So this is what he thought the Centre should focus on. One, uh, I would say, I will encourage them uh, when they create that center, they will create, uh, uh, they will have the students and researchers to uh, have fictionalized world of future, a fiction, imagination. What kind of world we would love to have? Forget about what we have, that's the material. What we love to have. Because if you have the imagination, someday it will happen. If you don't imagine, it will never happen. So don't start with the A, B, C, D and all these uh, uh, formulas and so on and uh, equilibriums and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, things, uh, which will lead you simply doing the thing which we have been doing again and again and again. Just take one more step. That's not future. Future is a sharp difference. We move from away from what we are, we go the other kind of thing. And to make it concrete, I would say, uh, the way I explain to myself, I would like to create a world of three zeros. The zeros that I talk about. Zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration, zero unemployment. That's my future. So once I know my future, I create all my imaginary ways to achieve it. All the thing, existing things, all the imaginary things, what will make me get there? And that's how we got to the moon. We didn't know anything how to get to the moon. We imagined it. And now we are imagining that we are going to the Mars, we'll have a settlement there and so on. Imagination. We make movies, we get science fictions. Unfortunately, we love science fiction. We love that. But unfortunately, 
we never encourage social frictions, which I think is very important. So we have to create lots of social frictions. If that the center is created, I think they should specialize in creating social frictions. Thank you very much indeed. And I suppose we should always be prepared for the unexpected, especially these days. So there we had Mohammed Yunus rather than Joe Stieglitz, but with a lovely bold vision of what we should look at and create social fictions. Um, mind expanding indeed. So Brian, let me come to you first. What do you think the center should focus on? Well, after Mohammed Yunus, I feel very much uh, grounded here as the uh, cosmologist. Uh, so to my mind, the key of the future of work that I would be studying is how to make it inclusive. And I say inclusive rather than equitable because life is not equitable. We're not all the same. And we really need to include everyone of all sorts of talents because if we don't, people will be left behind. And clearly people will be left behind. But I think the system has to leave as few of people behind as possible. It has to make sure that those people who are left behind uh, have a future of something other than discontent. And we have to make sure that intergenerational disadvantage does not flow from people being left behind. So to my mind, that is what I would love to see the Center for the Future of Work to look at. Thank you very much indeed. Chris, let me come to you next. Yes. So, oh, uh, what you would you ask the Center me? for the Future of Work to focus on? I'm sorry about that. Um, I think what you should do in a place like South Africa is, first of all, to make sure that the environment is there to create good jobs for everyone who wants to have them. Um, the, in, to, to go back to what um, Mohammed Yunus was saying, which, which of course is, uh, is uh, laudable, imagination will not get you anywhere unless you have the um, environment to uh, create businesses and jobs and the government gives you enough incentives and not disincentives to barriers. Um, there is a, uh, an infrastructure in place where you could uh, create and, um, and progress and flourish, and there is an educational system that can support these things. In, in a place like uh, um, even Britain, but the, even more so the other Northern European countries that have fully developed systems like that, then I would tell them exactly what um, Mohammed was saying go there and um, imagine, think outside the box, be creative and, and it will come along. But you first have to get rid of the barriers. I know it's boring and more boring than the previous two speakers, but it's essential. And I'm saying that because the, like four years ago, I established the Center for the Future of Work in London. It has exactly the same title as the one we are proposing for uh, Pretoria with uh, with two other colleagues, one engineer <clears throat> and the other a former lawyer and more into um, um, dissemination, but also uh, research on what's a good job, you know, focusing on those aspects. And, and there is a lot of work to do in, uh, as I realized, in these basic things, you know, like the big problem we have now in, in Britain and the United States, in fact, is the, is the gig economy, you know, all these online services, they're using workers on zero hour contracts, on uncertain work. Uh, what do you do with that? I mean, it's not as exciting as imagining the, the, the next uh, uh, Microsoft uh, software or the next uh, Spotify app or whatever, but, uh, but you know, there are thousands of people, if not, millions getting these jobs that they basically work on motorbikes. They just go up and down delivering boxes. I've had two today coming in my front door, in fact. Um, how do you, is that a good job? Is that good work? That's the future of work. That's where our digital societies are moving us. So that's what I would do. Get Go back to basics in Pretoria. 
Thank you very much indeed. Yes, and your learnings from the setting up the centre at LSE are extraordinarily valu valuable. So, Andy, let me come to you next. You're based in South Africa, listening to Mohammed Yunus, Brian, and Chris. What do you think? So, I think for me, there's a the answer to the question twofold. And if I look at first very pragmatically, I would say that the one skill that this, this new centre should focus on is that of interdisciplinarity. So coming from the private sector and from the workplace, we are seeing an increased need for problem and very complex problem solving ability that more than often spans domains and disciplines. So while there'll always be a need for deep subject matter expertise, um, you, you don't want a, a civil engineer designing a road who's done a series of Udemy courses. I mean, you don't want a doctor diagnosing you who hasn't done the deep work required to get there. But in the general workplace, we are ready for people who can span many disciplines and find solutions to real life problems as they present. So, from a pragmatic perspective, interdisciplinarity is key. From a different perspective, I think if you ask me what matters most in terms of the future of work, it would have to be the purpose of work. And to all the students out there, um, I have this to say to you. Once you hit the workforce, if you look at the amount of time that you spend at work, and then the amount of time you spend talking about work, and then you add the amount of time you spend thinking about work. Best you find something that you are passionate about, that you really enjoy, and that doesn't make you feel as if you are a slave that has been described earlier. Um, take into account the, the concept of the 100 year life. Gosh, I don't know how many people here can afford to retire at the age of 60 if you have to live to 100 or over. I certainly am not one of them, which means we're gonna be in the workplace for a long time. And work is a significant component of search for meaning. So, so my advice to students is focus on the purpose of work, be inspired, engaged by what you do, and for the center, help students find that passion. I mean, in conclusion, from a societal perspective, the purpose of work again is what is going to drive shared economic growth and shared value. It's more and more unpalatable to have any business that doesn't take into account the environment and the context in which it finds itself. So if you look, governments, even children, consumers, employees are all expecting their organizations to be purpose led. And when they're not, organizations risk losing their social license to operate. So we cannot continue with just profit being the only way forward in terms of making money. So I would really advise the future of work center in Pretoria to focus on what is the purpose of work in the shared economic growth for all and helping our students to connect with their purpose in terms of a very long ahead of them. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. So Zainab, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the conversation is revealing the complexity of, the, of what one's talking about. You've got very different groups of people. You've got those who can make life choices about finding work about which they are passionate and which is fulfilling and which, you know, give them a, a, give a meaning to life. And there are those who are struggling to make ends meet and doing whatever job they can find and, and finding barriers to get in those jobs that uh, were mentioned by Chris. What a complex problem it is. But so if, if you had to tell the, 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 the folks in Pretoria what they should focus on, Zainab, what would you say? So what I would say is that um, they might probably want to focus on coordination. So coordination in two ways. The first would be for the centre to be able to coordinate various stakeholders uh, who are uh, instrumental to the creation of uh, quality jobs uh, in Africa, you know, also, I guess, globally. So these stakeholders are governments, they are industry, and then they are also ordinary citizens. So starting with governments, it would be important to have a center that is able to think through uh, or allow governments to understand 
what are the constraints that industry face? Because oftentimes you find that there's a bit of disconnect there. And then for industry, for the private sector, it would be important for them to understand what are the priorities of governments. And then for citizens, ordinary citizens, then they also, so ordinary citizens here referring to students, referring to young people, uh, it would be important for them to understand the landscape that they have to navigate because this is constantly changing. So uh, a center like, you know, the one that is being set up can play that role uh, among uh, stakeholders to coordinate them. Another coordination role would be around policy. So again, you find that there's in quite a number of countries, there's a lot of disconnect. There's a lot of policy fragmentation. It would be important to be able to coordinate trade policies, investment policies, social policies, education policies, and industrial policies. And I give you an example with education in particular. Of course, you know, this has also been the subject of the discussions we've had today, that with education, in many cases, we need to overhaul education systems to align with, you know, the way labor markets are and are changing and the needs and demands of industry. So a, a, a center that is able to facilitate that coordination of different kinds of policies, I think would be very, very useful and helpful to help people navigate the future of work. Thank you very much indeed. So we've had already five visions of what this should focus on, which is lovely. I want to throw in a sixth. I'd like to have this comment from Joe Stiglitz that was, we, we recorded earlier. So if we could just play that and listen to what he says. Obviously, uh, the nature of work uh, is going to be very particular to uh, the circumstances of the country, uh, the continent. continent. Uh, if you were doing a, a uh, center in the world of work in Silicon Valley, it would obviously be very different than in America's Rust Belt. The challenges they face, the structural transformations they face uh, are markedly different. Uh, Africa and South Africa uh, are going to be facing uh, a lot of uh, difficult challenges ahead. Uh, just to give you uh, one example, uh, the economic model that was the model that led to uh, successful growth in East Asia, closing the gap between those countries and the advanced countries so dramatically over the last half century was based on manufacturing export-led growth. That model, uh, is not going to suffice for Africa. Well, mostly because global employment in manufacturing has diminished so much. So uh, Africa is going to need another strategy to make sure that there is a supply of jobs that is commensurate with the supply of young people looking for jobs. So that is going to be one of the very big questions facing Africa and South Africa. South Africa has had a long history of extraordinarily high unemployment. And so the problem in South Africa has been the lack of work. Um, and uh, that should be one of the highest issues, uh, a, a priority. How do we get jobs for everybody who wants them? So please feel free to jump in on each other's points or on this point. Um, I, Chris, I just wanted to ask, I mean, in a way, the thing about a center for the study of the future of work is that it has to encompass, uh, as, as Stiglitz put it, Silicon Valley and the Rust Belt. I mean, if it, if it seeks to look at work for everybody, it's a huge problem. Yeah. From your experience at LSE, would it be better for UP to focus more particularly on one group of workers, one problem? If you want to be productive, what do you think? No, I, I think, you know, obviously it will have to um, uh, face many problems, but I think it would be better if it does is if it does them sequentially rather than everything together, because there will be confusion and uh, some solutions may not even be good for something else. For, for South Africa, 
it, what Stiglitz said about the uh, lack of jobs is it reflects what I was saying earlier that for South Africa, don't think that you're going to invent the next uh, big app for uh, your smartphone. Think how can we create enough jobs to uh, employ all the people who want those those jobs. And um, if you ask why is there market failure and those jobs are not being created, it cannot be because there's a system of free enterprise that we have in over the last 250 years is done so much uh, for our societies. It just, it just cannot be that it, it will not work in South Africa. It doesn't have any uh, humanity that doesn't have any different uh, characteristics. There must be because of barriers that uh, government policies and that and, and any other, you know, there might be social barriers, uh, government barriers of kind that, that are stopping it. And, and I think the best, um, uh, most productive um, so sort of preoccupation of the Center for Work is, is to ask precisely that question. How can we make sure that there are no barriers to job creation? And how can we make sure that those jobs that have been created are good jobs with good pay and good career prospects, i.e. are productive jobs? <laughs> and that's it, just one question. One question, but actually it comes in a way ensuring no barriers to job creation is 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 now nowadays at least a social fiction so it takes us back to Mohammed Yunus um it's a good fiction uh Brian did you want to jump in well I think um Christopher and I are at least you know being a married to an economist but not being an economist uh I'm trying to say pretty much the same Christopher has just said is that we, we need jobs for all that want or need them. And I want to have the really high purpose that everyone should do a job that's deeply fulfilling. But I actually think there's an existential threat to civilization as we know it, to the stability, if we have large numbers of people displaced. And that can be the um, Uber Eats driver who's productivity relative to their parents is lower and is driven into the ground to what is not very interesting work uh, because of technology. Uh, but it could also just being just fully unemployed. Uh, and, and I just think that is a problem that is foundational. And so while I think it's got to be not having barriers to work, that, that's, that's a good place to start. But I'm not sure that's sufficient. Uh, and so the question I would ask, and this is really a question for Christopher, as much as I'm not sure how on the ground in South Africa, but as we have seen more and more technology, we have seen the financial returns to capital get higher and higher and higher over time, and the financial returns to labor get lower and lower and lower, and this is concentrating wealth to those who already have it. So I guess the sustainable thing in the future is trying to make sure that labor gets enough of the share of return of what society is doing so that we can all, uh, I guess, do something based on who and what we are rather than what we own or what our... Mm. I mean, I could come, I, I come in, I come in briefly, actually, because I'm sure you, you want to hear these as well. Um, I mean, that's absolutely uh, essential. That's what I would, I mean, when I said that there are good jobs with good pay and good uh, career prospects, it's precisely that they're not uh, Uber Eats drivers or um, Deliveroo uh, motorcyclists, as we have here. Um, and, um, and, and there, Although new technology is pushing in that direction because of um, of the much bigger companies, digital companies being created, uh, online shopping and and remote work encouraging and and everything, and 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 because it, it improves the, the techniques we have now, the technology it, it improves monitoring so that you could have something like Uber or Airbnb, where they can monitor a dispersed workforce that they never see. 
and and therefore they cannot <clears throat> monitor they cannot give proper incentives and, and all that uh, i'm afraid there the government policy there is is essentially in the united states they have a version to this kind of policy that we have in europe um the the problem that brian pointed out is is very much an american problem to some extent a, a british problem but it's not a it's not a german or a scandinavian problem um even even here in, in britain if you look at uh, uh, pre-tax earnings uh, of low uh, wage jobs and post-tax earnings that's a huge difference you know you, you might have a line about wages according to skill or pay and it and it will look like like that and then when government comes in the line sort of looks like that which you don't have in the in the states and you could design this kind of policy through uh, minimum wages uh, subsidization of training programs provision very importantly provision provision of social services like health um, for example child care services that will help more women come in and still maintain incentives uh, for work they, this is what they don't have in the states and in fact it's what i find the most objectionable with people of the way the american economy so the most objectionable thing on the way the american economy labor market is organized that they don't take this opportunity and help the lower uh, wage earners come up i stop i see your hand moving <laughs> right <in the> chris <laughs> It's fascinating, and the thing is, you're you're already beginning the discussions for the new centre, which is lovely. Um, but I just we we are out of time, and I just wanted to have last comments from Andy and Zainab, please. So, um, Andy, do you have just a? It's got to be a thirty second comment, but did you want to make a thirty second comment? Thank you. Yes, I think that the centre could have so many different areas of focus, and it can't be everything to everyone. And I think one of the most important roles they can play is that intersection between education and, and I think if we go that way, it's about mindset shift, contextual relevance. It should not only be economists who have this kind of knowledge about the labor market, about policy. So I think to focus on that relevance from a contextual perspective will give their students an ability to help solve these problems going forward. Thank you, Andy. Inclusiveness again. And Zainab, last word to you on this panel, please. Yeah, my last word would just be to emphasize on the point made earlier about coordination and perhaps working with other institutes uh, across other parts of Africa to also try to, you know, uh, create similar platforms in those countries because the future of work in every country will be very different given the endowment structure you know given their local conditions so perhaps also partnerships with other institutions across the african continent would be something that the center can think of doing thank you very much indeed thank you to you all uh, it's been a fascinating think tank uh, at the launch of this new center so um, i'm very grateful and um, I'd just like to, this is the end of our meeting. Um, in a second, I'll hand back to the studio in Pretoria, but I'd just like to thank all our participants for joining us today, negotiating whatever technical challenges have presented themselves and having lovely, fascinating conversations at, our, at the dialogue. Thank you. And thank you in particular to the audience for being with us today, um, staying with us, joining the breakout tra tracks, asking your lovely questions. I'm sorry I couldn't feature those photographs that you sent in of your workplaces at the beginning, but we'll find a way to distribute those via nobelprize.org soon. So for now, it's thank you to our partners and thank you from me and back to Ole in the studio. Thank you so much, Adam. It certainly has been a pleasure hosting this event with you today. I think this is one of those opportunities that tend to come along once in a lifetime. So it's been incredible. Thank you so much, Adam. I think it's only fitting for me to end my part for the day with an African proverb, my favorite African proverb, actually, considering we are on African soil. So this African proverb states, umwa no shenda, atasha ngi no kunaya. And what this means is that a child who never leaves his home 
will always think his mother is the best cook. So I think today we've heard perspectives from across the globe and we've learned so much from one another. And it was just a reminder that we still have so much more to learn from each other for the betterment of society, which I think is the point of the Nobel Prize dialogue.